morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Why don't we stand? Happy Sunday. And let's bow our hearts. Father, as the psalm says, that we will enter into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart. That's what we want to do this morning, Lord God. Each of us have so much to be thankful to you for, Lord. For all that you've done, Lord God, and Father, for the things that you will continue to do, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. You've been faithful to your word in every way. And you've been faithful to us, Lord God. We ask for your blessing on the service this morning, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that thy kingdom come that will be done today in us and through us, Lord God. Pray for our time of personal worship, Lord. That be personal, Lord, in each one of our hearts. That we would worship you in spirit and in truth, God. That we would acknowledge, Lord, who you are and your greatness, Lord God. Bless our worship team, Lord God, and they may they bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Good morning. Beautiful day the Lord has given us as we wrap up this summer. As I understand, the kids are going back to school this week. So, time moves on, doesn't it? Well, we're here because we serve a risen Savior. He's alive. He's alive in us. Thank you, Lord. Let's worship him. Let's sing his praises. Greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, empty grave, life eternal, you have won today. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Happy day, happy day, he washed my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed. When I stand in that place. Free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. In this joy, perfect peace, earthly pain, finally let me celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive, and oh, happy day. Sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed, oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious way. That you have saved me and oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day, Jesus and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day. Happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be 
the same Forever I am changed Ever I am changed Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Take a minute and uh, say hi to someone, share his love. known, Lord, through the worship and the praise and the adoration, Lord God. And Father, I want to thank you that you, through praise and worship, Father, soften us, Lord, before you, that the word of God may go deep within us, Lord God, and produce the fruit you desire, Lord. And sometimes that's freedom, Father, sometimes that's forgiveness, sometimes it's healing. 
There's no, it's always something wonderful from you, Lord God. So we open our hearts to you and the word of God, Lord. Make us teachable, Lord God. Instruct us in your ways. And Father, may you be glorified through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I see some of you are doing this with the fan. Is it hot in here? Yeah, a little bit. Well, the air conditioners are pumping. So if you have their Bibles, turn to me to the book of Romans chapter 10 this morning. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10. We'll put the air conditioners up a little higher. So let me share something that's pretty interesting that you don't know, I don't think. And I've labeled it, what your body will do in the next 30 seconds. It'll take eight breaths. It'll produce three grams of carbon dioxide. Your heart will beat 36 times, unless you have a real slow heartbeat. It'll produce 72 million red blood cells. Your blood will travel four miles. You will shed 174,000 skin cells. You'll blink six times. You'll have 24 thoughts. Boy, that's scary. Your body will generate 100 watts of energy and you will not be aware of any of these things that happen. Now, how many knew that? Most of you didn't, including me. There are things that <clears throat> we're unaware of because God's made us so wonderful that our body functions like that. But there are things that God wants us to know that are happening that he's doing within us. In the chapter we're teaching this morning, in the verse 17 it says, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God wants you to know certain things that he's doing, and some things he, you're not gonna know, maybe in a week, a month. Or, but this morning, I'm sure that God wants you to know that your faith needs to be increased. And how that happens is not by accident. It happens by you doing the certain things. It happens by you studying, by reading, as we will see. We'll go more depth into it when we get there. But it's important that we understand that God wants us to grow in faith and trust. And it happens by hearing the word of God. That's how it works. So I shared that with you because I want you to understand <clears throat> If you'll pay attention, if you'll do more than listen, if you will hear, your faith in God will become stronger and your trust, because you'll need that more than ever. If there's one thing we need today to grow in, is to trust God, amen? amen? Now, we learned last week that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and have compassion on whomever he chooses to have compassion. So we learned a lot about the sovereignty of God, that God makes the decisions. We also learned that Paul had a desire for the Jewish people to get saved, to know God, to have a relationship with him. He was so overwhelmed by the loss of their salvation, and no relationship with God, that he was willing to give up his own salvation for the nation of Israel to be saved, which he didn't have to do, as we learned. 
So Paul has a really hot, real big heart for those he loved, the people of Israel. And in this chapter, Paul kind of continues that same thought. <clears throat> and we're going to touch on that again this morning because I think it's important. Let's go to the very first verse. Brethren, talking to Christian brothers and sisters, my heart desire and prayer to God is for Israel is that it might be come saved or be saved. So Paul <clears throat> makes a statement, and evidently God has worked in his heart and given this desire in his heart for these people to be saved. It has become a burden on him. And again, I believe that God does that to every single Christian. It may not be the Jewish people, and I'm sure it won't be, but it will be people that we know and that we love, even relationships, family relationships. And how he starts that off is in your heart. God begins to put that in your heart to start to pray. And that means to entreat or to seek God for that man or that woman or that child's salvation. Here Paul shows us that he is praying to God for the loss. Now there are so many people in our lives who are lost. They have no idea that they are blind and they are deaf. They are lost to the truth of God, the good news. They think life is all about everything else but God. And that God is just a hindrance to their life of fun. This is why it's so important that we pray earnestly for them. Beloved, I believe that every person has been prayed into the kingdom of God. When you were blind and you were stupid in your sin, just like me, someone was praying for you, for your eyes to be opened. Now God wants us to pray for others who are lost as we were, that they may come to know him. <clears throat> Prayer is a powerful weapon given by God to us for the working of salvation of men, no matter how bad they are. There are going to be times that God puts it on your heart to pray for someone who you think it's impossible for God to save. But I want to remind you what Paul made concerning himself as a sinner. He says, I was the chiefest of sinners. I was the worst of all because I knew so much. And I sinned against God. I did horrific things against God. But God saved me. And let me share with you what God wants to do. Because he's praying that they would be saved. This word literally means <clears throat> deliverance or preservation. Safety. Deliverance from molestation of the enemies. Now, it's not easy to see things unless you're looking for him. Today, in our America, in our world, <clears throat> there are so many people who are being molested. And I'm not talking so much about sexual molestation. I'm talking about molestation of the heart and the mind and in so many other areas and so many other ways. When I think about what they're trying to do to our children in the sense of transgender, cutting off different things, ruining things for the rest of their life, changing them, destroying them, this is part of what the Bible speaks about when it talks about molestation. When a person gets saved, begins born again, the Bible says everything changes in their life. And the only thing that's going to save them from themselves and that world and their eyes to be opened is for them to become born again. But this word has more meaning than just that. It means about <clears throat> salvation from the penalty of sin. In each person, God has given us a thing called a conscience. Every one of you have experienced guilt. 
And when you do something wrong, even as a Christian, we would call it maybe a little bit more conviction than guilt. But God put that in us in the sense of guilt so we would know that we were wrong. Now imagine you become a Christian at 25 or 30. That's, a, that's what some of us became Christian at that age. And all those years of the guilt built up. <clears throat> the Bible says that when a person becomes saved, becomes born again, and they confess their sins to God, the Bible says all the guilt and all the condemnation of sin, of past sin, is removed by God because of Jesus Christ. We can see our world walks in guilt and condemnation, and they don't even know it, unfortunately. Let's look at another part. The Bible says when a person gets saved, the power of sin is broken. I no longer, as a Christian, have to be controlled by sin. Now it's by choice. So every person that you see, and we see a lot of them, walking to the dinners, who are hooked on drugs or alcohol or pornography or whatever it may be, the Bible says when the person becomes born again, the power of sin is broken in their lives completely. So if I'm a Christian this morning, God makes a promise to me when I got saved, sin no longer has dominion over me. Now, it can. It can if I choose to allow it. If I choose to walk in my flesh, sin will have control over me. But if I choose to walk in the Spirit, the power of the Spirit breaks all that and keeps it broken. That's how it works. There's two more things concerning this word called salvation or saved. The presence and the pleasure of sin. In other words, sin no longer has the same pleasure. The things you used to do before you were a Christian, you would think, man, that'll give me pleasure. I really enjoy doing that. And after you become a Christian, you recognize, you know what? It's not fun anymore to do that. I wonder why it isn't any fun anymore. The Bible says God breaks it. Paul used to be where these Jewish brothers were and knew that it was like being in bondage to the law. He also knew what religion, man's way to God, was like. A set of rules and many regulations. He wanted them to know the living God that he knew and he loved. He wanted them to have what he had, that full relationship with the living God. <clears throat> now look at me for a moment. I want you to think about this because I've thought about this before. Personally, what if God wouldn't have saved me? Where would I be today? What if God wouldn't have saved you? Where would your life be today? Every single Christian, God has intervened and change your route or your road, so to say. Every single one of you. But what if God wouldn't have changed your road? What if you would have made your own road and your own path? Where would you be today? I can't imagine being without Christ. And my thought is many times, but how would it affect my marriage? How would it affect my children, my grandchildren, the people that I, I chose to hang around with? It would affect it every area, wouldn't it have? Without a doubt. Paul wanted the same thing for other people. And I hope the Holy Spirit convicts you in the sense of you wanting that for other people. People that you love people that you know, people that you work with. Paul wanted them to have a life of the Spirit, which brought life, not the life of the law, which brought death. And we're going to learn about the law in just a moment. In verse 2, he goes on. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. He's talking about the Jewish people now. 
but not according to knowledge. <clears throat> so Paul makes a statement because Paul looked at his own personal life and he remembered what he, how he was. But he also, and he looks and he sees how these Jewish men, and even today this is true, and Jewish women were excited concerning God. They had a holy zeal, so to say, concerning God and defending God. Part of the reason we know for sure why Jesus was crucified was jealousy or envy. But part of it also is they believed that they broke, he was breaking their law completely. So they were adamant about having Jesus die. They didn't kill them, but we know for sure it was the hand of God. It was the providence of God. It was God's perfect will. And we knew was that's going to happen without a doubt. But we also know <clears throat> that these people were zealous for God and zealous for the law. And they would kill you if they could for this truth that they believed. Now, these people had a fervency about God and about serving him, but they didn't know him. A.T. Robertson said this, they sought God in an external way by rules and rites, and they missed him. Think about this. You follow the law every single day of your life. In other words, you're really religious. You get up every day and you do certain rituals, so to say, certain traditions. And you think you're doing everything to please God and doing the things that you believe God would want you to do. And they're totally the opposite. And you do that all your life since you're four years old, five years old, and you do it until you're 80 years old, and then you die. And you find out everything you did was completely not according to God's plan. What a waste of a life. They became zealous for the letter and the form instead of for God himself. It ain't enough to be religious, beloved. Religion can be defined as zealous for spiritual things. Paul's point here is that these people are very, very religious, but not enough. Some people say, well, as long as they're sincere, you can be sincere and be completely wrong. There are some today who fit in this same boat as these Jewish people. They will come to your door by night or day or night. <clears throat> they will not watch any TV or play sports or drink certain beverages. But their zeal is not according to the true knowledge of God. Let me say this before we go on. The reason why I serve God and I get in this pulpit every Sunday and every Wednesday is because of my personal relationship with God. If I was religious, if I had to, set a, to follow a set of rules and laws and traditions, and that was what my relationship with God was and formed in, I would have left serving God a long time ago. But you and I as Christians have that intimacy with God every single day if we desire, if we'll surrender ourselves to God. And that's what God wants. I don't follow God because I have to. I follow God because I love him. Now, there are many religious people in the world today, and they think if they just do the right thing, and their good outweighs the bad, then God should accept them. The only thing is concerning that thought, who's going to pay for their sins? Now, we talked about their zeal. Let's talk about ours just for a second. God wants us to have zeal for him. With knowledge. God wants us to be excited about him and excited in, of mind. I want to read this word to you. Webster describes it as zeal. To be excited, to praise, the intense enthusiasm 
as in work for a cause, ardent endeavor or devotion, fervor, ardor, emotional warmth, passion, eagerness, enthusiasm, zeal, intense heat, fire, passion, strong love, affections, strong emotions, that has an overpowering of compelling effect, burning intensity, a constant glow of, of feeling. Now, God doesn't want us to go on our feelings, but God does want us to have zeal for him. So let me ask you this question. Think about it. What causes you to lose your zeal for God? Let me share a few with you. It can be trials. Trials don't that we don't understand. Raise your hand if you understand every single trial that God's allowed in your life. Don't raise your hand. Because none of us do. Trials we don't understand at times will cause us to lose our zeal. We need to understand that trials are used in our lives to purge us from things that are hurting our relationship with God and others. And for us to learn to trust God, no matter what happens in our life, that's pretty heavy. They are to drive us closer to God, not away from God. That's what trials are supposed to do. That's what God intends them to do in us. The second one is it can be sin. Having other love before God, the love of the world, and the love for the flesh. The Bible speaks about this, a love of pleasure. Our nation loves pleasure, beloved. They want you to love pleasure instead of loving God or have a zeal for God. Football season's coming. <laughs> There's my point. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with football? No, there's nothing wrong with football. Football's okay, it's, it's entertainment, it's a sport. But the problem is men, especially, can make football their God. I know of a man who, when football starts, he doesn't go to church anymore until the whole football season and every game is finished, then he comes back to church. That's bad. So it can be sin that causes us to lose the zeal for God. It can be a loss of surrender to God and his word. It can be a belief that God did not do what he thought we thought he should. That would cause us to not have zeal anymore for God. Well, he's going to be like that. I'm not going to follow him the way I used to. It can be a divorce or even a death of a loved one. The Bible teaches us how to keep zeal for God. Those are hindrances, but he's, these are things we must do to keep that zeal. The first one is I must abide in Christ. The word means to wait for, to wait on one, to not depart, to continue, to present, to remain as one. So as I abide and cling to, adhere to Christ, in my relationship, the Bible says, I won't lose my zeal, and my zeal will stay. Let's look at another one. We must love God first. In other words, be our first love. God must be first in our life. Let's categorize God today and where he's at, honestly. Is God first? Is God second or is God third? Where would you number God in your relationships concerning people or things? Is God first? God doesn't want anything put before him. We could call anything or anyone put before God idolatry. So God wants us to be, he, he wants he himself to be our first love. 
Let's look at another. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So we must do our part. If not, the zeal will move toward someone or something else. So have you lost your zeal for God? Why? Come back to God for make him your first love. Now, it says here that they had zeal, but not with knowledge. This word knowledge in the Greek means precise and correct knowledge. Used in the New Testament of knowledge of things divine and ethical. The Bible speaks about Paul about his zeal. Let me read it to you. It's in the Acts chapter 22, 3 and 4. It says, I am indeed, indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up into the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are today. And this zealousy led me to do this. I persecuted the way to death binding and delivering into prison both men and women. And that's what Paul's zeal did. He had zeal. He'd do anything. He'd kill people. He'd put them in prison. But he had zeal without knowledge, not knowing what the Word of God really said. He missed it. Let me look at it and show you with you another scripture. Same thing with Paul. Galatians 1, 13 and 14. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. I have persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. In other words, religion. Man's way to God, not God's way to man. Paul was just as zealous, or even more for God, after he became a Christian. Now, he goes on. For they being speaking about the Jewish people, ignorant of God's righteousness, seek to establish their own righteousness, not submitting to the righteousness of God. So Paul speaks about them being ignorant. It really doesn't mean not knowing. It means not understanding or to err in sin through a mistake or to be wrong. That's what it means. The Jewish people were wrong in trying to become righteous, acceptable to God, to what they did by trying to follow the law. This was a purpose ignorance. In other words, they chose to be ignorant. It wasn't that it was not shown to them, because it was. Paul presented the truth many times, but they rejected the gospel, the good news. They were set in their ways and their thoughts as they would have God in no way on their own terms and their terms only, not God's. They said to God, in my, it is my way or the highway. There are people like this today if they see something different in the Bible than what they already believe, they will shun it. Or say that's not what it means. God couldn't be saying that. They have selective believing. I found it to be true. The more I know about God, the more I realize I don't know about God. The more I need to learn. And they reject the God's righteousness on purpose. I believe it's in our nature to be religious. I believe it's in our nature to reject God in the sense of, I want to do it and make it on my own. I can do it. I know I can. And really, it comes down to the big P word pride. There were many in the Jewish religion who were very proud. 
We are God's people. We belong to God. We're special people. And all these things are true. They're completely true. They weren't believing the lie. God said they were like that. God held them in high esteem. And he still does. But they didn't come to God because of pride. And there are many. And that's the number one thing that people reject Christ for. Is because of their pride, I believe. They seek to, to establish their own righteousness, it says here in the scripture. They worked hard and put much work into establishing or making firm or fix their own righteousness, which was built on the sand. When I grew up, I grew up in Catholicism, as most of you know. And there are seven sacraments that you have to take or have in order for you to go to heaven. So it's a works base. You have to be christened when you're a baby. You have to be baptized when you get a certain age. You have to go through confirmation. You have to go through marriage. You have to, there's seven of them. And doing all those things doesn't allow me to go to heaven. But that's what is taught. I can't work hard enough to earn righteousness before God. I can't. It's impossible. It is through Christ's righteousness and his alone. But there are many people, even the church, who try to do this to earn God's blessing. And they are already completely blessed through what Jesus has done for them. Notice what it says in the same verse, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They've not submitted themselves to the, God's control to yield to one admission or to admission, to, or to advice, I'm sorry. To submit to the righteousness of God is to submit to receive what Jesus Christ has done to his life and death on the cross. It is to receive by faith his righteousness, which is the only righteousness acceptable to God. They would not submit to it. They wanted to stand on their own righteousness, which would bring spiritual death and separation from God forever. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When a person, no matter what his ancestry, Jewish or Gentile, accepts Jesus as Savior, the law is ended for them, period. The law was to turn us to Jesus as a Christian. I am no longer under the law. Jesus fulfilled it for me and for you. So when I look at the Ten Commandments, and when you look at the Ten Commandments, what do you think? You may say this, well, let's see, I didn't do this one. I'm doing pretty good. I didn't do that one. I didn't do this one. Well, covet of my neighbor's goods. Uh, uh, thou shalt not lie. Uh, thou shalt. <laughs> my point is, the Bible says that we're not under the law. The Ten Commandments are good to look at and to remind ourselves and even become convicted by them. But Jesus has fulfilled them for us, and we don't need to live by them. That's important. And Moses writes about this righteousness, which is of the law, that man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, you will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or... Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. I'm going to read a different translation to you. It says, But faith's way of getting right with God says, Don't say in your heart you will go up to heaven and bring Christ down to the earth. And don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back again. And faith speaks again. This is faith speaking in the next verses. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, 
that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The faith says the word is near you, and it's speaking about the rhema, the spoken word of God, which God has said is God's message. <clears throat> he says that if you confess, if you agree, that's what the word means, declare openly, speak out freely, and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Here's where salvation begins for every believer born again. But it's just the beginning. Now we repent and we walk with God and we follow and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. We're being constantly changed in the image of Jesus. And this is just the beginning of being a Christian. Now it's a life. It's everything. Now we've learned what the Bible says about confessing and becoming a Christian. That's how it happens to every single person. But God didn't just save us to save us. God saved us to have a relationship with him. Could you imagine this? Unfortunately, this does happen. You decide you're in love with a man or you're in love with a woman, opposite sex for sure. And you decide we're going to get married. And so you set a date, you get married. On the first day of your honeymoon, you decide, I'm glad I married you, but I'm really not going to have any time with you because I want to do my own life and do my own thing. Would that shock you as a husband? Would that shock you as a wife? It would me. And there are Christians today who have this same mentality sometimes in the sense of, I've accepted Christ, I've become born again, I'm a Christian now, and now I'm going to continue to live the same life, the same selfish life, my same wants and needs are going to be met by what I do, what I think, how I act, where I go. That's what some people say concerning God. And God wants to be your life because God has plans for your life and it's the best plan that you could ever have, period. There's no greater plan. Now, I want you to reminisce for a minute. Remember the day that you were saved. The day you confessed Jesus with your mouth and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That is the day you and I as a Christian should never forget. I can remember being in the house on Palmer. That's where my wife and I were renting from our father-in-law, her dad and mom. And I remember it was about 9 or o'clock, no, it was about 11 o'clock at night. And something was going on, and I got on my knees before God, and I called on the name of Jesus. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I needed God in my life. But I can remember in the bedroom where I was, I can remember exactly, the, oh, I think it's 11 o'clock. But I haven't forgot that, and I remember it. It is a day that I'll never forget, and as a Christian, you should never forget it. So where were you when you did this? This is the day that your life changed forever, and I mean forever. This is the day your name was written in the book of life. This was the day you fulfilled your first and most important purpose in life, to become a child of God. This is the day you became born again, as spoken of in John chapter 3. This is the day you started a whole new life, a spiritual life. A life where all sin is forgiven. This is the day you started a new relationship with the living God. So let me ask you a question. Do you remember that day? If you don't, you should have. And if you don't, maybe possibly you weren't born again that day. Sometimes we need to go back and remember where it all started. 
Life starts at Jesus and will end in knowing it with Jesus. Now, verse 10. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. God's word does not say. With the mind, the word of God must go down about eight more inches to the heart. You heard me make this statement. Billy Graham was asked, how many Christians are there in the church today? He said 25% or less. Why did he say that? Is that possibly true? It is because many that confess Jesus, they confess it with their mind. They believe it here. But it needs to go eight inches more. They have to believe with their heart because when they believe with their heart, they do, truly do become born again. As a child, I did go to church a lot. I went six days a week, and boy, was I holy. Just kidding. But I went there because I was supposed to do that. I went to Catholic school, so you were real more or less made to go then. And that didn't make any difference to God in the sense of me going there because I didn't know God. I wasn't born again. I never truly received Christ. I didn't know how, really. I was ignorant. My parents weren't Christians, and they didn't know how to do that either. Now, he goes in verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. In other words, be disgraced. Okay, look at me. This is an important part. One day you'll stand before God when you die. If the rapture of the church doesn't happen, which I'm praying that's going to happen in our lifetime, and there's a great possibility because of all the signs we see, but if it doesn't happen, you're going to stand before God. And what you believe in your heart and you have confessed with your mouth will make you acceptable to God, period. And you will enter into heaven as God's children and no way will you be rejected by God, but accepted in the beloved. While on your deathbed, you'll be reminded of these words of life and they will keep your soul secure. And we will all be here one day again, unless the rapture happens. This is assurance that God wants you to have. And then he goes on, for there is no distinction between the Jew or Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich on all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how is one saved? Believing in your heart that Jesus came down from heaven, died, and arose. Believing you're a sinner. Asking Christ to come into your heart and live by confessing that. The Bible says this is how you're saved as you call upon the name of the Lord. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you concerning this same thought. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 23, it says this. And Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In other words, God can save anyone, and I believe God wants to save everyone. Matthew one twenty one says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 18.11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. 
I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 13 for a moment because there's a longer scripture I want to read and then we'll be done in that part. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. And it says this. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside the knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? And then you'll begin to say, we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself are thrust out, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and they'll be first who are last. Beloved, God has established a way through Jesus Christ. And the cross offends people because the cross tells us there's only one way to God. If it were possible that man could be saved any other way, the cross would not be necessary. Jesus said this in the garden. If it's possible, let this cup pass, but not my will, but thine. Now, God wants all men to be saved. But it only happens to one person sent by God, Jesus the Savior. I want to read a scripture to you that emphasizes that. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. It says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one mediator, how many? One. Between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified to due to, in due time. Our society is trying to get us to believe that all roads lead to God and that we need to accept every single road because if you don't, you offend people or you hurt their feelings. The Bible says God has made a way to heaven and it's through Jesus and Jesus only and we need to stand on that truth. Verse 14, how then shall we call on him who is whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who have not, they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news. So in this scripture, I have this question for all of us. Will you let God use you for them to hear? We are all sent by God to tell the lost the good news. It's not bad news. They won't be saved unless we tell them about Jesus. These verses are the very heart of why we send our missionaries out around the world. That's the very heart of why we must tell others about Jesus. A woman named Rose Crawford had been blind for 50 years. I just can't believe it, she gasped as the doctor lifted the bandages from her eyes. After her recovery from delicate surgery in an Ontario hospital, 
She wept for joy on the first time in her life. A dazzling and beautiful world of form and colored greeted eyes that now we're able to see. The amazing thing about the story, however, is that 20 years of her blindness had been unnecessary. She didn't know that surgical techniques had been developed and that an operation could have restored her vision at the age of 30. The doctor said she just figured there was nothing that could be done about her condition. Much of her life could have been different. There are people all around us who need to hear about Jesus. They are full of guilt, they are lonely, they have no purpose in life. They are hopeless in despair and they fear death, many of them. And there are some of them, many things that are those without Jesus have in common. Beloved, we have the answer. Now, he goes on, and we're almost done. But they have not obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, The Lord who has believed, who has believed our report. So in other words, they would not listen. They would not hear, nor would they hearken to what God says. Today, there are some who refuse to obey, even with the evidence of truth. They choose not to believe, but this is to their own detriment, even to the detriment of their family members whom they love. It wasn't long ago that I met a young girl. She came to church, she was 19 years old. She accepted Christ. Her whole life changed. And she made this statement. I wonder what my life would have been if I would have been raised a Christian. Now raise your hand if you accepted Christ, say after 20. I did. 19? Some of you accepted Christ earlier. But I want you to think about this. Growing up, if you would have been a Christian, Imagine what your life would have been like and the changes that would have happened. The hang-ups you wouldn't have today. The fears that you have to deal with. If you would have been raised a Christian all your life. I emphasize a lot about our children getting saved. Because when they get saved and they get truly born again, if we as parents live the way God wants us to live, an example, and they teach them the ways of God by word and by deed, it'll save them so much heartache and so much pain and so much sorrow. I want my kids to, and I still do and did, to have much better than what I had. And the greatest thing I could give them is that relationship with God. So, verse 17, I've been waiting for this verse. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So it talks about literally receiving or hearing within our own ears the voice of God, what God speaks. So Paul tells us spiritual truth here. Concerning how to make your faith grow. Many of you have thought or asked or even prayed to God to help you to have a greater faith. Paul shows us how to hear the word of God. The more we hear God's word taught and read, the greater our faith will be. Beloved, being in God's word does increase your faith. It builds you up by giving you a clearer picture of God. As we spend more and more time in God's Word, we get so much better about knowing God, His loving kindness, His faithfulness, and all that He is. 
By knowing God better through his word, we grow in faith and trust. I've found it to be true. It's hard to trust somebody that you don't know. If you know God well, you will have no problem in trusting him at all. If you want your faith to grow, you have to study the Word of God and hear it taught. That's just how it works. Now, I emphasize that with this in mind. What is going to get you through these coming days? Every day, I don't know what to expect in the sense of what's happening in our world. In the book of Matthew 24, it speaks about two things mainly, and it says a lot more other things in the last day, but I want to emphasize two. It speaks about chaos, that there's going to be great chaos in the last days. So let me ask you, do you see much chaos in our world today? The second thing it speaks about is deception that many people are going to be deceived. I need to know the truth so I won't be deceived. I can't emphasize it enough. In order for you not to be see, deceived, you have to know this. You have to know your Bible. You have to be taught it. You have to read it. You have to know your Bible. If not, then it's a possibility that you can be deceived. And we see deception growing more than anything else, I believe, personally. And we see chaos growing more than I've ever seen in my life. But once I know this, and I know the writer of it, the more I understand him, I have knowledge of him, the more I'll trust him. Let me tell you what's going to get you through these coming days, is your trust in God. That person that you know personally, that you spend that time with every day. So faith comes by hearing, and by hearing of the Word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, they have. Their sound has gone out to the earth, and their words are the end of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I'll provoke you to jealousy by who, those who are not a nation. I'll move you to anger by a foolish nation. That's talking about the Gentiles. But it does say, yes, they did know. But Isaiah is very bold, and he said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask me. Again, he's speaking about us, the Gentiles. And he ends this verse with, but to Israel, he says, all day long, I stretched out my hands to disobedient and a contrary people. Let me read a different translation. It says, but regarding Israel, God said all day long, I opened my arms to them, but they kept disobeying me and arguing with me. So he calls Israel disobedient and contrary. These two words are interesting. Disobedient, not to allow oneself to be persuaded. To refuse or withhold belief. To refuse belief or obedience and not to comply with it. In other words, they knew and they heard it and they said, no, we're not going to do it. No matter what, I'm not going to do it. I don't care what God says. And contrary, to speak against, contradict or oppose. To refuse to have anything to do with. Could you imagine that? Christ presents himself. It's been prophesied that, he is going to, that God's going to send the Messiah. He fulfills all these prophecies. He does all these healings, and they still reject him. So let's recap just for one second. The Bible teaches us, like Paul did, we need to pray for those who are lost. And we need to share the gospel, the good news, the good tidings, it says in the scripture, with him. 
I personally have been praying that everyone here in our church have a burden for the lost. God has put people in your life, neighbors. Mm -hmm. I live where I live because God has, I believe, ordained it. And there are neighbors I get to share the gospel with. I get to invite to church. I'm still working on them. Still praying. But all of us have those same people around us. Are you zealous for God? Have you lost your zeal for God? Remind you, righteousness comes by faith. Right standing before God, acceptance by God comes by faith in what Christ has done in Christ only. And last but not least, have you received Christ by faith? The Bible teaches one day we'll all stand before God. And it's only going to be really one question asked, and the question is going to be, what did you do with Jesus? And those of you in this room know, if you've accepted Christ, you know what you've done with him. Don't be like the Jewish people who were contrary and disobedient to hearing the word of God. If you're not a Christian today, God offers you that. Just confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and the Bible says you shall be saved. Father, we are grateful for the word of God today. I know, Lord God, you've made us a promise, and your word will not come back void. That, Father, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You've strengthened our faith, Lord God. But you've also shown us, God, what we need to continue to do to make our faith stronger and stronger, our trust, Father, larger and larger, God, concerning you. So give us a love for the word of God. Father, put a zeal within us, Lord God for your word and for you. And as we go into your word, teach us more about you, Jesus. Again, we as Christians thank you, Father, for drawing us to you and saving us by faith, by confidence, Father, and trust in you and what you've done through your son, Jesus. Simple, but Father, but deep. We thank you now in Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Today we have the Lord's Supper. So are they bringing our children over? Todd, where are you? Okay. Okay. I always enjoy the Lord's Supper. It's not so much a tradition. It's something that reminds me of what it costs God for me to be saved, for me to know God, for me to have a relationship with God. But it's also a time to be cleansed and washed. I go to God on a regular basis and ask God to forgive my sins. But the Lord's Supper reminds me and it gives me a little bit more time, I think, to look a little deeper to see if there's something that God wants to cleanse me from. The Bible teaches us why we partake of the Lord's Supper. It's to do this in remembrance of Christ. So we remember what Jesus did and what it cost him. It also tells us that before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to examine ourselves and see if there be any sin that we need to confess to God. God will forgive us if we confess any sin that we've done or committed, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. But we have to confess. But then God requires another thing called repentance, a turning away from that. So let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, we remember what Jesus did for each of us, Lord God. And if we were the only ones ever born, you would have sent Jesus for us personally. 
And Father, you sent Jesus for us all personally, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the blood that was shed for each of us. Father, for our sins and the condemnation and guilt, Father, that sin brings. We thank you, Lord God, for the body that was broken for each of us, Lord. And Father, for the door that was opened to us called heaven, God, a place to be with you forever and ever, Lord. Father, in your words, we bring it back to you. You say, Lord God, to search our hearts and see if there be anything in us, Lord. And we need to confess to you, Lord. And Father, you know our hearts. Sometimes, Father, we aren't good searchers. So we ask for your help by the Holy Spirit, God. For I know it's your heart as a Heavenly Father to forgive us and to cleanse us and to wash us. That's your heart, God. So as we take a moment now, Lord God, please search our hearts, Lord God. And Father, in your words, you say, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So cleanse us now, Lord God. And Father, we are grateful for your forgiveness, Lord. May we turn by the power of your Holy Spirit away from that sin and our hearts turn towards you. Father, may we also forgive others uh, we has been forgiven, God. May we release others, God. That's part of forgiveness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Would you come up and get the Lord's Supper and then as the worship team plays? Ty, Ty, would you close the lights, please? Just 
sin and left a crimson stain. He broke and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take your and eat. same manner he also took the cup after sub saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink and in remembrance of me take drink let us stand this morning we have pastors up here if you need to pray I think Tony's here this morning any prayers he'd love to pray for you if you want to come up to the altar, please do. If you want to pray and just spend a little time as this worship team leads in a song, then we do, we'll dismiss. We'll have a 10 minute break between uh, the prophecy class, okay? God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Jesus paid it all. all to him I Sin and left crimson stain, he walked in white as And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, the video will start here in a few minutes.